A very good afternoon to one and all. I welcome everyone to the eighth day of our ongoing uh, faculty development program and refresher course. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to have Professor Anil Anija amongst us today. Um, so today's session is going to be an extremely special one uh, as uh, Dr. Anija is going to discuss with us uh, is, uh, is going to deliver a talk on the topic accessibility and law. Uh, we uh, welcome you, sir. Uh, I will request our technical coordinator to please play the PPT, uh, for, sir. Yeah. Um, can you please play the slideshow? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Anil Aneja has a long and distinguished career of more than 30 years in academics. Presently, he is working as a professor in the Department of English, University of Delhi. His significant books include um, novels of L.H. Myers in relation to Indian history, myth and thought, human rights and volunteerism, combating discrimination, some path-breaking initiatives for the visually impaired, and a comparative study of the visually impaired children studying in special and inclusive schools. Sir's recent publication is an edited volume of 20 autobiographical stories titled Testimonies of Success. We uh, already have it in front of us that uh, such a, a seminal contribution sir has made to the subject of uh, disability studies and what wonderful publications also he has to his credit. Uh, Professor Anil Aneja is also uh, the nodal officer as well as grievance redressal officer for persons with disability and officer mm -hmm. on special duty at the Equal Opportunity Cell University of Delhi. For nearly 25 years now, Professor Anija has been actively involved in the disability sector in various national and international roles. Presently, he is the president of the All India Confederation of the Blind and the Chair Rehabilitation Committee and World Blind Union. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, now, looking at the uh, awards and honors uh, uh, which have been conferred upon Sir so far, so Professor Aneja was conferred the National Award for the Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities by the President of India in 2014. In 2017, he was presented with the Achievers Award by the Indian Eye International Human Rights Observer. He was also conferred the State Award in the category Best Individual working in the field of social work by the government of NCD of Delhi and the prestigious Rustam Mewanji uh, Alpaiwala Memorial Award 2020 by the National Association for the Blind. Recently, Professor Aneja was also conferred the prestigious NAB Sarojini Trilok Nath National Award 2019. Already, as we go through Sir's uh, contribution, uh, as we as as we go through Sir's mm -hmm. laurels, I mean, we 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 feel so fortunate mm -hmm. to have got this opportunity to have Sir amongst us and interact with us. Now, I will no longer want to stand between you and uh, uh, Professor Aneja, and I heartily extend a very very warm welcome to Sir once again. Uh, and, uh, thank you so much for sparing time for us today, Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. May I then, Nupur? Yes, sir. So we are waiting for your talk now. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. First of all, um, heartiest congratulations to Maitri College and Khalsa College for conducting this unique perhaps the first in the country of its kind, FDP on accessible technologies and higher education with particular reference to persons with disabilities. A two week FDP, I, with whatever written knowledge I have of the country and abroad, uh, have not known any such course happening 
in the form of an FDP in any university, at least in India. This is the first initiative of its kind. There have been a lot of courses on disability studies, certificate courses, and so on and so forth, but not an FDP, uh, which is recognized as an FDP uh, by an accredited institution, and in partnership with two colleges. So, mm -hmm. really, functionate. Uh, um, uh, Battery College and uh, Harsa College for undertaking this initiative. Um, and also the fact that such a large participation has been there shows the growing interest that has been there in this area in the recent years. In fact, in the recent times, there has been a spurt of academics as far as interest in disability studies and accessibility is concerned. Uh, six, seven years ago, when this matter was talked of, perhaps people were not accepting, they were not open, they're not as willing to accept that the area of disability studies, accessibility and accessible technologies could be an area which could find interest among scholars. That, however, has substantially changed now with so many colleges offering courses in disability studies in various ways. Uh, recently, we had two other colleges also offering different courses, uh, separately offering courses in disability studies. Uh, we also have disability studies now included at the undergraduate, at the postgraduate, at the MFIT and the PhD levels of Department of English. Uh, we also have disability studies included, not just in the curricula or Department of English, but also of many other departments of the university. So there's a strong growing interest uh, in this area. And I'm so happy that the two colleges have taken this unique initiative. I think people like uh, the principals of the both the colleges, uh, Professor Hariti Bachopra and uh, Professor Jaspinder Singh, deserve our special congratulations, uh, also the coordinators. Dr. Spiti Singh and, and uh, Dr. Armod Kumar who have worked very hard and also the volunteers and the participants to make this course successful. In my discussion with you today, <clears throat> I will focus on three or four areas challenging such certain uh, stereotype myths which are associated with accessibility and technology, which is our area and law. I will first try to establish that accessibility is not just an issue which concerns persons with disabilities. The issue of accessibility, the domain of accessibility, particularly in the context of higher education, goes much beyond persons with disabilities. Two, that all of us, we in some way or the other, are violators of accessibility in some way or the other in our role in various ways in the higher education institutions. I don't think any of us can claim that accessibility is practiced 100% in the area of in the higher institutions. Uh, if you're raising hands, okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't think any institution can claim today that it meets 100% accessibility standards as far as applicable standards, as per law. Now, this is the way rule of law comes. Uh, uh, as far as uh, mandated standards in law are concerned. And the third point that I want to establish through my discussion with you this afternoon is that in case we have to achieve inclusive growth and real inclusion in society, specifically in higher education, inclusive growth, which is most integral for the total overall development of the country. Otherwise, soon the time may come, uh, that my time may come that India may not even be called a developed country or a developing country in case we don't achieve inclusive growth. So, 
if we have to achieve inclusive growth, then there is no other way but to make our systems and our attitudes accessible. Not just system, even attitudes. In fact, the first problem of accessibility is attitude. And the fourth point that I wish to establish with you is that law has a very important role to play in today's context to ensure complete accessibility in higher education. These are the four points that I want to talk about with you essentially. I want to focus on these four points because often we do take accessibility rather for granted. If, if, if one was to ask someone uh, whether he or she practices accessibility, is a supporter or accessibility, or if we were to ask the question in another way, whether he or she finds the word accessible, the possible answer may be yes. Yes, I am a person who finds the word accessible. I'm talking about anyone. I'm not keeping disability at the center right now. Um, and that is not my major discourse. Disability and accessibility, yes, very important that as an illustration. But as I said, accessibility, my first point is, accessibility goes much beyond disability. Uh, so if one were to ask these questions, your answer would be no, yes. Uh, and yet, you would experience that in day-to-day -day life, there will be many situations which are inaccessible for you, or where you do not practice accessibility as a teacher or as a squatter. I assume that is the that is the uh, the uh, profile of the participants broadly. So, for instance, if you are very tall and you get into a Maruti 800, not many are seen on the road these days. But if you get into a Maruti 800, even I would say Siyad, which doesn't have a very tall uh, ceiling, very high ceiling, you may find difficult negotiating. Already many tall drivers have complained that they have difficulty driving Maruti Siyad because uh, the head touches the roof and they are not comfortable in the driver's seat because the seat cannot be managed very easily. This is a complaint for many people who are driving as expensive a car as Maruti Siyad. Now you may say, you may debate the question whether Maruti Siyaz is accessible for persons with disability or not, whether it is accessible for persons with autobiography, whether it is autobiography. Yeah, those are not the issues. Even a person who doesn't seem to have, seemingly doesn't seem to have any accessibility issues, has a problem with us as harmless a vehicle as Maruti Siyaz, which is pretty expensive. But that is an issue. Access. Maruti 800 for tall drivers can't get into. It is it's very difficult. Similarly, very often, the other side of that, in your homes, you may have found, and these are very common examples, but that's just the point, that we take accessibility for granted when we cannot take accessibility for granted. It is not something that we can take for granted. It has to be worked upon, it has to be ensured, it has to be monitored, it has to be evaluated. So at home, many times, you may have found that you want to change your tube light, clean your fan, simple things, get into the locks to pick up something or to keep something in the uh, uh, which is store, storing places which are above, storage places are above, and you need to use a ladder or a stool or a chair. Why do you need to use that if all that is accessible? You need to use those because Obviously, those spaces, those spaces are not accessible, and you need to make them accessible by using a chair or a chair or a staircase or whatever. Yeah. So in or a stool or whatever. So what happens then? This is a very simple seeming process. What is it doing? It is making you use technology. Technology is not something that is computer-based or something electronic. You know, again, technology is very narrowly understood, I would say. 
We just want to forget that at one time, we all have read this in our school books, I'm sure. The invention of a wheel itself was considered to be a major technology. I would say the wheel is a major technology even today. Without, if, if, if there's no wheel one day, many things will come to a standstill, literally come to a standstill, including our cars in which we travel and many, many other things. May not be, we'll be wanting the vegetables and do groceries at home because there's no transportation then. So wheel still is a very important technology. We have all read in school that uh, invention of wheel was a major technology. The point I'm trying to say is that, that technology is considered something very computer-based, electronic, very sophisticated, advanced. But no, any supportive system used to make uh, the world a bit better place then you may otherwise find it is technology. So in this case, particular case, a stool or a staircase, which helps you climb and reach out to that point in your home, which is otherwise not accessible, is technology, is technology in a very simple way. Thus we see that technology, while it is, make, is able to make even very simple situations like keeping things at home accessible, it is not doing so for a person with disability, because even a person who is physically non-disabled would need those kind of support. And those kind, there are hundreds of examples that can be given when you need support to make things accessible. That is the first thing. Now, as we see the word around, we find that it is a very fine place. And it is a place where everything is accessible. If I was to ask you whether your television is accessible, you will say, yes, it is accessible. But then what about a visitor who may come to your home, who is a guest and who is visually impaired? Is the television, is your television accessible for him or her? You may still say yes. Because you may not realize that the merely listening to the audio may not, is not the entire television experience. It, the viewing the screen also is a part of television experience, which is not there. So your statement that your television is accessible is immediately called into question because what you said thought was accessible for you is not accessible for somebody else. And then I give a third scenario. A person with hearing impairment comes to your home and is able to see the screen, but not able to listen to what is going on in the television. Is the television accessible for him or her? Your answer would be again, no. So where do you, so where do you now stand? You said your television was accessible, but it's neither accessible for a person visually impaired friend of yours who's come home, no for a person who is hearing impaired and has come home. Now, there are only two conclusions which can be drawn from this scenario. One can be that you were somewhere wrong when you said that your television was accessible. You perhaps did not know your television too well. Or, which is also partly true incidentally, or a better scenario perhaps could be that to say that subjective, that accessibility is a subjective experience. And that's just the point I was coming to. What you may think accessible may not be accessible for a majority of people in, in the environment. So uh, how, do we, how do we make then such situations accessible? If accessibility is so subjective, then is there any way by which the subjective experience of accessibility can be made the objective experience of accessibility? Is there some way by which standards could be put in place by which things are so, environment is so designed, not items, I'm talking about environment. Environment came anywhere. I have not touched the most sensitive area so far, which is your classroom. 
or uh, or of you may see many of you may see that you give accessible lectures but is that the is that the is that the case are our lectures in our colleges and universities really accessible do we really have sign language interpreters in our classroom to ensure that if there is a hearing impaired student he or she is able to access your lectures do we really have sensitization and technology enough to read out the notice board or the blackboards or the screen even this even this uh fdp on the reasons why i am not doing the powerpoint today <coughs> is because i was told that there are a large number of persons with disabilities in the course and if that is the course i at least do not know maybe there is i also do not know any technology so far which makes screen accessible for the visually impaired while seeing the powerpoint on mobile on jaws it may be but even if it is accessible to two voices you are negotiating the sound of the speaker and you are negotiating the sound of the screen reader even now when i am talking to you i am the messages which are coming on the screen are being read and it is a disturbance that's why i'm pausing sometimes because you cannot negotiate with two sounds at the same time is very difficult so power of presentation may be accessible for many people but it is not accessible for persons who are visually impaired and therefore a program which you may treat as very accessible the fdp may have difficult i don't know whether we have sign language interpreters maybe priti can help us but if we don't that is another challenge so in the system itself in the very design of the program we are inbuilt in accessibility and yet we say that we all know accessibility that is the paradox we, and that's why i said that we take accessibility for granted in our in our normal day to day world and yet everything that we seem to do there's somewhere or the other in accessibility inbuilt in it and therefore the role of law comes in because law is required to ensure that there are objective standards in place which make it possible for the environment whatever environment it, be, it doesn't matter whether it's your drawing room uh television it doesn't matter whether it is your online fdp it doesn't matter whether it is your classroom or anything and i think accessibility is one phenomena which is which is perhaps after the presence of god accessibility is present everywhere almost everywhere i unfortunately i'm unable to say think of any place which i have found in my life which i say 100% and 100% means 100% for everybody everybody not just for visually impaired not just for orthopedic impaired not just for hearing impaired there are other disabilities also the people suffering from so learning disability people suffering from many other disabilities a body in place which is access to 100% for everybody and why a person for disability there are people who suffer from psychosocial issues there are people who suffer from uh, the, the the people who are not very tall and there are people who are excessively tall the people who are too thin and the people who are too fat there are all sorts of people in the world is there a place really who, which is accessible for everyone in every possible in terms of total experience what to talk of a classroom lectures and television these are big things a small buffet organized at your home or in your in your college may not be accessible for everyone because uh, in a buffet how do you expect a visually impaired person first without assistance to go without assistance i'm underlining that word to go and know what is where and then be able to take that many times people come and say uh, buffet mein aap kya lenge are how do i know mai kya lunga mujhe kya pata wahan kya hai is there a way is there a menu in brain so my point is it is not independently accessible one needs to take assistance a person on wheelchair how do you expect to name him or how to negotiate the buffet and yet we say we are a very inclusive college so inclusion and accessibility 
unfortunately so far remain a myth and if these remain a myth i would also not i would go so far as to say that these do not only remain a myth these remain also significant violators of what i would call human rights because human rights demand equality equity and freedom of choice these are a, and and dignity if you were to ask me to define the four pillars of human rights i would say these are equality equity freedom of choice and equity equality freedom of choice and dignity these four pillars of human rights are violated sometime or other if the environment i'm still on the general environment i'm not going to specific uh environment is inaccessible in fact article 1 of the universal declaration of human rights which uh, was which was adopted in 1948 uh in fact very strange that universal declaration on human rights was adopted in 1948 which was which i would say was the first significant after the second war the world war the first significant international instruments on human rights the constitution of india we all know came into force from 26 january 1950 more than 70 years after both the occurrences we are still talking about accessibility and our basic human rights we are still talking of accessibility and approach and inclusion has something really gone some either we have not been see very serious about our national and international uh international uh, de de declarations we have not been very serious about uh, uh the commitments that we have made so sort of commitments we we have made in our uh i think i'll switch off the voice i hope i don't lose the connection because uh, so many people joining and leaving is really disturbing just a minute yes uh nupar uh, am i audible and visible now because i gave a command to my friend uh, yes sir yes sir you are very much okay. perfect thank you yes so hopefully now i won't be distracted with the sound yes uh, so either we have not been very serious about our international and national commitments because if we really are serious we talk about udhr now if you are serious about udhr and we are serious about the first article of udhr which talks about equality and freedom of brotherhood article 2 talks about no distinction on any basis article 3 talks about the whole idea of owning life and property by anyone are we are these rights really accessible are these rights really accessible again i said accessibility goes beyond technology and disability you know it is when we talk about accessibility in law it's a mistaken notion to say that we are talking only about disability yes disability is a important illustrator the violations and the support that one gets through laws in terms of accessibility for persons with disability can be used as a, an example to you know, point out how laws can be used to promote accessibility for other categories also and accessibility is an important area for more important area for persons with disabilities because challenges may be greater and laws are more effective that's why that's another reason why that rubric is useful but by no means should it be understood the problem of accessibility this if anybody has a myth i think that sooner we break that the better nobody should ever think that that, that accessibility is a need only for persons with disability it's not as i said the right to own property the right for a dignified life is everyone even today <clears throat> we talk of human rights we know in many communities in india despite anti dowry act and the right of a daughter to own to inherit property we when aware that in many communities after marriage the daughter of the house doesn't get right on property it's only the sons of the home property and the daughters are expected to give no objection certificates i ask 
I asked someone. No, but I would again need your hand because my iPod has gone. Just confirm whether I'm audible and visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you are. Yeah, and in yeah, fact, sir, for your convenience, I have uh, uh, taken away the waiting room, so there'll be no text coming on your screen now. No, 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 no. It's fine. I have switched off the voice over, so there's no problem. Not the text. Oh. Come. There's no problem. <laughs> that doesn't disturb me. But one of oh. my earpods went, so I just thought I'd take it. Yes. No, no, sir. So, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, and I asked someone, "What is the logic behind this practice?" Many years ago, I asked someone. I'm, at that time, I may not have been that much into human rights, and the person said. Then in a nonchalant way, the person said, oh, because so much money is spent on the marriage and dowry of the person. And therefore, we, 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 the, we, it's assumed that she would not have any right to the property of the partner. I mean, such stupid logic. But it is there, we all know, that such discourse is there in many communities. And therefore, just a minute, I'm putting the charge in, just give me. But you know it. No, but just last time, once again, is the screen okay now? Yes, yes sir. It's absolutely okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, but such such attitudes are there. If the right to property is not accessible, uh, the right to dignity is not acceptable to many people for various reasons, social reasons, economic reasons. The right to privacy. When there's any hardly people had not even have one room houses in India. Maybe next of people are living in hutments. Where is the right to privacy? We all know that people till very recently didn't even have washrooms in their homes in villages. Uh, and maybe still some villages are there, some areas where the, the issues are still pervading. Where is the right to privacy? And so on and so forth. I can give you a number of examples of violations and inaccessibility. And whereas there's an inaccessibility, the only instrument to ensure accessibility is then the other legal provisions. And this is where there is a relationship between accessibility and law, that accessibility cannot be ensured by sensitization. That's not just one thing, because it's cost intensive. That's another thing to be seen. Sensitization can help to some point, yeah. But if when the cost comes, for instance, if your library needs to be made accessible for the vision of you say, yes, yes, we want to do it, we all know it, but where is the money? Of course, there's a different uh, issue now that not all technologies are cost intensive. It's possible to find easy accessible solutions at low cost. We will talk about some of them uh, later, hopefully for time permits. But uh, yes, there is a cost. If a building has to be made accessible, there's a cost to it. If a vehicle has to be made accessible, there's a cost to it. So, and those costs that have to come from the government exchequer, for which, of course, there have to be then provisions and laws. And therefore, there is a deep relationship between one, accessibility and law. And number two, in the context of higher education, that relationship is very important because we will defeat our purpose of very purpose. And I'm making a strong statement there. I will even defeat the very purpose of our higher education in case we do not make our institution accessible. Not just for persons with disabilities, for everyone. And that means keeping low fees, maintain, keeping enough books in the library so everybody can get those who can't afford, afford books. Tuition charges should be reasonable. Transport facilities for those who are unable to afford trans, uh, transport. And of course, an atmosphere of amity, even uh, uh, a bad atmosphere, a negativity in atmosphere, forget. You may give all the facilities, but if there is a negativity in atmosphere, then there would be issue of accessibility. The person may not even feel like coming to college. So even the accessible environment also needs to be there, friendly environment, affable environment, where everybody feels included, everybody feels accepted. That is also a part of accessibility. Now you would say, how does that happen then? because this is the taught order, everything to be made accessible. It is to be made accessible because not for others, but for ourselves. Because if we are known, of course, thankfully NAC has this system now, they, they, they check institution various parameters and everybody wants to get A++. Many couldn't get last time, they've been trying this time. Uh, that's one reason, but a better reason than that, I would say is 
to have the dignity for our own institution. That people should recognize our institution as an inclusive institution. The inclusion is very important because we are at the crossroads of higher education today globally. There is this tussle between interdisciplinary studies and in-depth knowledge of a subject. We don't know what is right. Uh, there, there is a long debate going on in education circuit. There is also a debate going on in education sector between globalization and national interest. There's also this debate between merit and reservations. Many people are talking, NEP talks about merit, but what happens to reservations? This is also an issue. And uh, uh, empowerment. Empowerment is equally important. Everything cannot be, empowerment cannot be sacrificed at the cost of uh, some, other, some other requirement, which may be there, and there needs to be a balance between the two. Also, there needs to be a balance, something which has become very much in work, Technology and traditional learning. For last one year, we have all been doing through working through technology, including this FDP, and we are doing very well in that. But also, there has to be some way by which a balance needs to be maintained between traditional learning methods and technology, which is a need of the hour, and the new education policy supports that. And the only way we can we can we can we can negotiate hope to negotiate this crossroads of interdisciplinary studies versus in-depth knowledge, globalization versus national interest, merit versus empowerment, and technology versus traditional learning can be by adopting only one approach, which is called the accessible inclusive approach. And this is again, accessibility becomes very important for higher education. And therefore, legal provisions are necessary because human beings unfortunately do not work unless there is, of, may not often work, or many times do not work unless there are, there are mandates which we are compared to follow. There are mandates which we are compared to follow. I just mentioned to you, it's been more than 70 years since the UDHR was signed, adopted. More than 70 years since the Indian constitution was adopted, and yet we are nowhere. So even the mandates have not worked and therefore we need strict laws. Now, what do laws say about accessibility in the, I will talk only as an example now, in three contexts, I will talk only in the domain of higher education. No, I can go much beyond that. I already made a general remarks on uh, as how accessibility goes much beyond that, how accessibility goes much beyond disability. Uh, and how accessibility is something which affects everyone. And therefore universal standards are required. And who is going to ensure the universal standards it is a legal provisions. And how these have or have not ensured, for, uh, the, how the legal provisions have worked or not worked to ensure accessibility, we can learn through one context, the context of disability. And that's where disability becomes important. So what are the issues of accessibility in disability in con the context of higher education? The first, we all know, that we do practice very, we try to practice as strictly as possible. The policy of reservation, 5% reservation in admissions in higher education. Now, that's a law. It's a different matter. The Delhi University, even before any such law was ever in place, was providing reservation in admission, even before 1995. Uh, to my knowledge, it was sometime in 1970s <coughs> when it was rule was made that 1% seats would be reserved or two seats in a college and two seats in a hostel, some such thing. It was very even, but <coughs> some attempts were given, attempts were made to provide reservation during mid 70s onwards, which became of course formalized in, 1970, in 1995 after the uh, implementation of the PWD Act, RPD Act which now mandates 5% reservation. We all have in our colleges this rule and we, many of us are involved with the admission process. We know there is a 5% reservation. Now, what does reservation ensure? Does it ensure education? Does it ensure knowledge? No, it doesn't ensure education or knowledge. I would put it differently. And I would say it should ensure access to education and knowledge. 
it is a means by which it 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 because reservation itself doesn't ensure education there are many more things required for it but it is a law which ensure it joins upon institutions to make such provisions which can lead to access to education knowledge for persons with disabilities because it is not this, this is another problem the reservation is taken only admission ha theek hai form bhar do admission kara do no if you are given if you give reservation for any category forget again persons with disabilities it is your mandate it is your responsibility then to ensure that person gets all the facilities on the material on the accessibility to buildings access to classroom otherwise how he would he or she get the education and knowledge and therefore i say it is not reservation doesn't ensure education it ensures the right to access to education and knowledge there being a distinction between the two statements and this right is a first right of access which now then brings into account other rights of accessibility uh i will not go into various laws that have come into the history of nikan provisions ensuring accessibility uh, uh i think time may not permit to do that because or i may just list it for you if we talk about various laws and provisions it was in 1977 there the first accessibility law came people have even forgotten about it because nobody talks about it now it was exact executive order no i would say i would even go before that 1974 the first access to education was through a scheme which is called the integrated education for disabled children now say what is so big in that scheme you know government keeps making schemes no it is important because again this enjoined rights of access to education the scheme and therefore it to scholarships to availability of assistive devices and this scheme and also more importantly this was the first time that the government was talking of integration as a vis-a-vis the principle of special schools for persons with disabilities till now the thinking was special it was a the kutkutari ka report of 1966 the first time there was a discussion about integrated education and i hold that the government policy of iedc integrated education for disabled children of 1974 was in response to the recommendation one of the recommendations of the kutkutari commission we talked about integrated education for persons with disabilities when that time they were not the handicapped children uh and to me this is all an important access law because education became open integrated first of all mainstream so what whatever we call mainstream education became legally open even through an executive order but it became legally open for not that people were not going to regular schools or yes some people went but it was a formal statement of the government in id you see and also access to scholarship equipments etc when we talk about accessibility to employment the first executive order was in 1977 which reserved 3% seats vacancies in group c and d services i regard that as very important because hundreds of people got a job thankfully soon after that there was this uh, international year of the disabled in 1981 and then international decade of the disabled person from 1983 to 1992 due to which hundreds of persons with disabilities got jobs because of this executive order of 1977 schools offices the this also ensured access and without access you can't find space you can't get visibility you can't even demand for other rights you can't be economically empowered if you don't have access to employment and education and without this access to education and employment if you uh, if you uh, don't have ex- these accesses then you cannot be economically independent and if you are not economically independent then nobody is going to respect you if the, you know uh, unfortunate unfortunate it is that even in this human rights discourse the the key that really works is sabse bada rupaiya if you have money in your pocket if you are economically empowered 
you wouldn't get dignity. We have seen, I can tell you many examples uh, of sea change attitude of community and families towards persons with disability just because the person has got empowered. By way of a slight digression, I just want to point out to the one scheme, the one, one project we run at AICB. Uh, I'm also the president of AICB, as many of you may know, uh, which is called the community-based rehabilitation program in which we go to the villages. We uh, And I know where I left it. So I left it on the status bar and come back to it. But it's an important illustration I want to give here. So uh, we go to the villages, we identify which would impaired person, train them, and after training, we give them a small grant, non-refundable grant, we don't take that money back, uh, of 15,000 rupees. And with that money, we set up 15,000 rupees. We set up a small business for them, a petty shop, some, some goat, cow, whatever, you know, or some agriculture work, which they can do themselves or with the help of the family and become uh, earning members in the community. Uh, you will not believe, but this 15,000 rupees really change, not just the life of the person, which would be a paid person, but also the lives of the entire community, the entire attitude, because now he's an earning person. He's a provider to the society, whether it's a petty shop, whether it's goat or whatever whether it's uh, farming, whether it is a uh, uh, cow or buffer, you know, he's a provider now. So the role changes from a recipient to a provider just because he has access to this earning facility. And of course, technology becomes very important. And now uh, it is also mandated, in fact, uh, even now that 5% reservation has to be there in all poverty alleviation schemes. This is a law also to give access to various schemes so that even the right to economic independence and the reality of economic independence can reach even to people who are in the rural areas, people below the poverty line. So that is the power of money that you from a receiver, you become a provider. From an object of charity, you become a tool of empowerment. And therefore, economic independence is very important. And I come back to where I left my uh, argument earlier to give this illustration. And that is that the 1977 executive order giving 3% reservation was a very important step forward. Then we got the PWD Act. And now uh, the three documents that you should keep in view, uh, I may not have time to go through them in detail, but I'll go through the important provisions now of the three uh, of the last document, which is the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016, only in the context of higher education and what, how we can use this law to ensure greater accessibility in our institution for our own benefit, because uh, people have woken up. Let's, let's really remember this, that dawn has come, people have woken up. And if we don't give them accessibility and rights, when they go and get it, which is which also history tells us. Whenever rights have not been given, people have gone and ahead and got it by whatever means that, and that's going to happen. So it's better that we ensure. I know there are budgetary constraint, other constraint, but at least one thing we have in abundance, and we should use it. It's in our stock, and that is empathy, not sympathy, but empathy. One thing we have in abundance, and we should use it, and that is positive attitude. One thing we have in abundance, and we should use it, and that is humanity. May I just say, um, of course, I will tell you the important provisions of higher education and accessibility just now, but before that, just one, one statement, and that is. If somebody were to ask me, which were the happiest days of my life? I would without hesitation say that one of the happiest years of my life were those which were spent at St. Stephen's College as an undergraduate and a postgraduate student. Uh, please don't ask me when that was. I can only tell you that there were no laws. There are such, such discourses and discussions which are happening today did not happen. We didn't, we, we didn't even know, we didn't know where to go. There was no law. 
there were no books no accessibility the word accessibility was not even heard of those days nobody talked about it i'm not that old by the way but still i think old enough to belong to that era uh but that apart uh so what are my happiest day years what it says even why the thing was there there were no laws no provisions no no accessibility the word did not exist technology word did not exist law in terms of disability did not exist but what existed was the three things that i talked about attitude empathy and humanity and the supportive attitude of the institution if there were no books because i was doing a subject where no books were hardly anybody in the country would be studying the subject at that time now so many of them are doing uh, <coughs> so there are no books my library had an agreement with the library of congress to us and most of my books used to come from there it took 6 months 4 months 5 months customs had to be cleared all those problems were there but there was some attempt made by institution and in the interim strong human support in terms of readers and all that without cost to me and without asking by me i didn't never had to ask anyone the nss and the social service league of the college was uh, essential enough to anticipate and proactively act and those were the happy but so the point i'm trying to say though we will talk about laws but it is unfortunate that we need laws to ensure accessibility in our institutions is unfortunate these things should happen on their own higher education in this country has always been inclusive and positive if you look at our ancient institutions broadly inclusive of course there were some cases of discrimination even then i'm not saying it was all perfect but we never had special universities okay there are two right now but that's a different story uh special universities and all that special schools have been there we are always we as a culture indian culture are committed to inclusive culture in higher education and yet we need laws to ensure accessibility i think we need to think we really need to think something over but even if that's the case then what do we do what are we supposed to do what are the laws to ensure access so uh the three acts that i was talking about three documents i was talking about was the pwd act persons with disabilities act of uh, 1995 the united nations convention on the rights of persons with disabilities the international document 2006 i will not talk about both of them because the enabling provisions of both the documents have now been incorporated in the last document that we have the rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 so uh but even before that 2016 is long way uh just two incidents i want to take give you where accessibility was ensured through law it was in 2002 and 3 that there was a visually impaired student who was doing masters in computer science 2002 it was master is in computer from a state university but no and behold he was doing masters in computer science but was not allowed to take his own examinations on computers the story i have covered in the in one of my books uh, called combating discrimination which new for group referred to uh, combating discrimination some path making advocacy initiatives for the visually impaired this one of the aacb cases that we took up so he was not allowed to take the examination on computer though he was doing a masters in computer application but this was the irony of it so and we got an order from the court of the chief commissioner failing which after which he was allowed to use computer later on of course directions came and many people are using but that to my knowledge was the first case where a visually impaired person had used computers uh accessibility became very important in higher education and law was used to ensure that accessibility that's one incident one incident i want to talk about before i come to specific provisions of higher education institutions uh is a simple issue but very important we are many of us travel by rail we book tickets through the irctc website we are very open to it a few years ago two or three years ago when irctc changed its face the website became totally accessible the simple thing that you can do very easily booking a ticket but became inaccessible for visually impaired that accessibility also needed to be ensured again by going to the chief commissioner of office and getting orders from there the point i'm trying to make i by taking this one institution one incident one instance from a educational institution and one incident 
from a domain other than education, from daily life, booking of tickets, etc., travel, is that the relationship between accessibility, the relationship that exists between accessibility and law is equally valid across, whether we are in higher education institutions or not. For instance, our Delhi Metro is reasonably accessible. Spiti had a fall from there once. But despite that, I would say, even that case, we took it up in fact, you know, and we, we, we took up and was covered. And it was a pretty bad fall that Spiti had at that time uh, from the Metro platform, uh, shows how inaccessible the platform is. But despite that, Spiti, I would say, compared to other facilities in the country, like railway stations, bus stops, et cetera, the Metro appears to be reasonably accessible now, I think that human assistance also there goes for me. The point is, why is it accessible? Law is there, but more so because there was a foreign company which has set up this uh, infrastructure. And because of that, the consultancy of the foreign company thinks they were accessible. Now, the point I'm trying to, are we so copycats that we need people from abroad to tell us? When our own law, the laws and legal provisions are shouting and shouting at us, we need others from other countries to tell us what we should be doing. Have we not really done away with our colonial mindsets even today? And therefore, there's a wake up call. There's really a wake up call because now, if we don't do what is supposed to be done, because <clears throat> one thing the post COVID has done is it has proposed challenges for people, new tech ways, but it's also awakened people. It's been a quite a jerk. You know, it's quite a shocker, and the shocker has woken up people. So more challenges would come, more demands would also come, and we need to be ready to make meet those demands. Also, we need to make our systems in case accessible and inclusive, because another document, legal document now, the new education policy mandates that there is a very specific reference in new education policy chapter nine to accessibility for persons with disabilities in higher education. And very, very specific provisions are there in that. So far, you are all in law, act, whatever. But this is a government policy education which all universities are going to follow. So I often say that this is a boon for us as per person with disability. Because first time, my regret always has been that often much has been said about disability and inclusion in school education. But people often stop there. People did not come to higher education because it was taken for granted. As I said in the beginning, we take disability for granted, uh, accessibility for granted. But the first time there's a government policy in which is talking about high, uh, higher education and inclusion and accessibility. So we have no choices. We really have no choice. We, we didn't do it ourselves, that's accepted. We did not ensure accessibility. Now, now we take its own course, at will ensure. Follow it, comply it, good. If you don't, then something will happen. Yeah, but, but I mean, we can't escape now for now, as we all know. So then, after scaling so much, you may ask me, what is this now anyway? So the first law, as I said, is 32, RPD Act, uh, Section 32, Reservation. The moment you make a student enter <clears throat> your institution, we take responsibility of the students in every way, not just by giving you filling a form and giving admission and maybe sometimes fee waiver. No, we take full responsibility of the student. That is the meaning of reservation, that you allow space. A space has to be in every sphere, not just in terms of admission. We have to ensure that our classrooms are accessible. In Delhi University, whenever we get any complaint or any issue that uh, classrooms are on the upper floor and the lift is not working, we are always directed that classrooms and our lift is not there in the building, that such classrooms should be on the ground floor, adjustments may be made. Of course, if there are technical reasons sometimes the lift doesn't work, that are beyond one or two days, five days, 10 days, beyond control. Uh, I know in Arts Faculty, they we installed the lift for good for five years, it didn't, for two, three years, it didn't work because there were technical issues involved. <clears throat> Those issues, but even then, whenever somebody represented, we always try to ensure and we advise others to hold your classroom on the ground floor. Even if it means shifting, in my own department, there was a student on wheelchair, and uh, so we shifted. We took a room from another department on ground floor, and we gave one of our room upstairs so that classes could be held on the ground floor. 
Even that far we have gone. So ensure that admissions, classroom accommodation, binding accessibility. Maitri has a lot of ramps and uh, 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 tactile paths, very impressive indeed. But the point is, often when we talk of infrastructure and binding accessibility, the concerns of the visually impaired are often overlooked. How would a visually impaired person uh, without support assistance, if he or she comes to a binding, unknown binding, negotiate himself or herself is to be thought of. Much work needs to be done in this direction. Hopefully the government will notify accessibility laws very soon. And they do that, we will have more space on that. <coughs> but even now, whatever we have notified, we have not implemented. Whatever has been implemented or notified in law. For instance, section 42, of the rights of persons with disability. I don't want to burden you too much with references and sections. That doesn't really work because uh, technicals are not important. What we should be doing, the contents, the essence is important. <clears throat> Sorry. So, Nupar, would you give me a warn around five minutes before? Uh, most definitely, sir, I will, for sure. What's the time now? What's the time now? Sir, it's four o'clock. We have half an hour with us. So, maybe we can take. 15 minutes. Uh, 15 yes, minutes, sir. so that's 15 minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. Definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so section 42 of the RPD Act says it's a law that all websites and contact available in print or audio should be accessible. Very good. So very simple and very nice. All websites. Are all our websites accessible? I would even ask. Is the University of Delhi website accessible? Only accessible? Better than others. Definitely better than others, but that is no answer. And this is where cost comes in. You say, yes, you are talking about accessibility, but who, who is going to pay the cost to it? My question to that is, the answer to that is, when you want to buy an air conditioner for your college, who pays the cost for it? When you want to buy a water cooler, who pays the cost for it? When you want to renovate a room, get the building painted, who pays the cost for it? If money can be made available for those, why not money can be made available for it, making the website accessible? Many things can be done very simply by giving basic training to your webmasters and doing a one-time accessibility. For a simple thing, like ensure that all your documents are in searchable PDF or word format. Even if it's an image, these days apps are there, free of cost apps are there, and hundreds of them. I mean, literally hundreds, metaphorically, but three or four that I know at least. Free of cost, virtually free of cost, hardly a cost. You know, uh, even Google has a facility to do that, that all the images can be converted into Word document. So put your image if you want to, but also put a Word text file or a PDF, such a PDF text file with it. So nothing, and most of our documents are created in computer. Even if you have to take a printout and sign and then rescan and put it to your signatures are required, still the basic computer document can be put up and just term it circular for holiday on Monday, 29th March, and then next file circular for holiday on Monday, 29th March, accessible file. Along with that only, put another link. What is there in it? It doesn't cost money, but we would not do it. If there's a picture on the website, ensure that its description is there. There are some issues in embedding. We have tried to have some problems there, but those can be solved. So the point is, if efforts can be made for other things, after it does cost a, an effort to put material on the website. Earlier website did not exist. The material used to go to notice boards, but now somebody puts it. So that effort can be undertaken. Then the effort to make it accessible can also be undertaken. If money can be found for other things, money can also be found for making the website. And this doesn't cost much, that requirement for me. And this is mandate, you, we need to do that. We need to do that. All our print and audio content should be accessible. I said, sign language interpreters. Or then we need to look for facilities which can automatically convert audio into text. I understand some experiments have been there. Uh, but we need to work more on that, but we need to find together. As far as print accessibility is concerned, sad news. 
sad news but true in 2014 we provided we wanted to make all libraries accessible give but you know though strictly speaking it is a responsibility of the college to buy materials and to uh, you know to ensure accessibility to for all because college is a separate establishment it has a own governing body but as a one time measure the university wanted to help and ensure that all libraries become print accessible so we gave camera scanners to huge number of colleges ki please use this we gave them a laptop computer with it attached to this we gave training hardly any college very few colleges have used that you know very few colleges have made the library accessible but if that was done most of the reading challenges for the visually impaired would have been overcome all the libraries would be accessible and would be for everybody not just for visually impaired it was universal design anybody could then scan a book and take home on pen drive his or her pen drive or email to himself or herself a scan soft copy of the book any book it was real time scanning so the point is even when we have the money and the where without we don't have the will power to do things and that is the problem that's why our constitution i refer to the constitution provision in india and the udhr and said given after 71 years we are still talking about accessibility and law why are we talking anybody would say it is already there go and follow it but no we will talk about it but we will not follow it and that's the sad part and this is where i hope this fdb does make a difference uh, because we should act and uh, i would strongly urge the organizers please do a monitoring six months we did this ftb there were a topic in what aspects have changes been there we are also going to start something of that kind very soon now uh, at the eoc that we are going to write to all colleges but then colleges don't respond and please remember that we cannot we only have an advisory role with colleges we cannot do more than that but we they don't respond so please ensure so this is one accessibility that we can do immediately without a cost that our open materials can be accessible audio materials can be accessible on our website can become this this can happen in one month because now there is a camera scanner which also scans hindi books sanskrit books in eleven indian languages apart from english and doing very well i have done extensive testing on that it is giving me 96 97 98% accuracy which is pretty good anything more than 90 95 is pretty good as giving more than that but then are we willing to do that it costs only 20000 rupees are we willing to spend we will buy air conditioner which costs double the amount for the for the for, for the staff room or wherever we will not buy this for visually impaired students because there is no separate money by ugc why should ugc give separate money college gets money why can't we take it from student welfare fund from any other development fund any other fund it's very easy to find excuses but laws are there because somebody if laws are ever come into force there's going to be an issue so that is one section of rpd act that we should talk about the second section we talk about is the point of providing uh, changing our curricular and examination systems university has been very proactive in that i give you two examples um when we changed the syllabus some years ago undergrad never english department we had a graphic novel the moment the problem was pointed out this is a graphic novel there would be a problem for visually impaired we immediately gave an alternate text also it's not that we removed the graphic novel you see accessibility it doesn't mean it's the cost of anyone no it's an inclusive the moment one thing is done at the cost of another is not inclusive so remember that accessibility whether it's technology or any legal provisions or whatever is not at the cost of anything else because that is not inclusive so we kept it open but we also gave it alternate text very often we get uh, requests from students who are doing economics and commerce which will be impaired students that uh, uh, they have difficulty managing papers with graphics and whenever we get we try to ensure i i take a strongly tend the exam branch to ensure the alternative papers and alternate questions are given but that is examination when we make curricula many of us are involved in making the syllabus 
do we really ensure that our syllabi is compatible, is accessible? No, we don't. And not accessible only for persons with disabilities, even gender sensitive, language sensitive, region sensitive. These are also the barometers of accessibility. How much your syllabi is region sensitive, language sensitive, gender sensitive, and disability sensitive, of course. We need to ensure accessible syllabi, not just in the non pictures, even our classroom lectures. Reading out whatever we are writing on the blackboard or PowerPoint doesn't cost anything. There's no money involved in that. A few minutes extra, but as you write, you read out. As you speak, you read out. I do PowerPoint in my head. I'm not doing it really deliberately, but I do it a number of places. Most I, I do it. Just for the other day, I had an extra entrepreneur. I did the PowerPoint. But then I ensure that whatever I read out, whatever is the other slide, I speak it out in some form or other that nobody's missing it. I don't take the content as read. I speak the content despite the fact this PowerPoint, because these days, uh, Many people are not able to hear with their ears, they hear with their eyes. Uh, there was a point when there were no PowerPoints in conferences. We used to really happily write papers and read. And those days were not very far, very, very recently. Now some people have some people have difficulty understanding if there's no the words seem to just go about, you know, go somewhere in the side. So PowerPoints are required. Uh, not very sure if it's a good thing or bad thing. I don't want to go into the merit of that. It's not very inclusive. Maybe people find it easy to concentrate. Fine. It's an inclusive technology. I understand that. Accessible technology, which works for accessibility for the non visually impaired now. They find the lecture much more accessible if it's PowerPoint based. But what about visually impaired? So accessibility cannot be at the cost of anybody else. So therefore, read out whatever is there. So classroom. I already told you, they have to be at a place where everybody can teach. Everybody means everybody. You know, there may be people who are short in height, who, who may not have any disability, but they're asthmatic. So they cannot climb stairs. Even those situations come sometimes. They have difficulty climbing stairs. So they have to try to have a lift to their quality. The government is giving generous grants. Generous grants is the word for physical ac infrastructure accessibility. No college is using it. So much money is available. Nobody is using it. I don't know why. So ensure that and, and that that resource which is available would help your college become legally compatible in terms of accessibility because these are there are modern building bylaws of 2016. There are bylaws laws prescribed for accessibility in the RPD Act. All buildings have to be accessible. All roads have to be accessible, all transport systems, uh, all existing buildings, uh, thankfully, or unfortunately, as you want to put it. I mean, you would say thankfully, I'd say unfortunately. It's a question of perspective. Uh, the government notification uh, on accessibility is still awaiting. The moment it comes, within five years of that, which is not a very long time, all buildings will have to be, existing buildings will have to be made accessible. It's better than we do it before, so we are not under time pressure. Because NAC has already started putting strict standards on accessibility. They're the top and not. NIRF. Uh, does talk about accessibility. God forbid a time may come. I hope it does though very soon. That when grants will be linked into accessibility. That if you don't ensure accessibility in your institutions, and again, I reiterate because the term is often misunderstood. I reiterate, yes, Nupur? Um, yes, sir, sir it's uh, uh, 415. Yeah. Okay, just two, three minutes. Yes. yes. As, as, yeah. yeah. God forbid that a time may come, though I hope it comes soon, that grants will be linked to accessibility. And by that, I don't mean only for persons with disabilities. How much the environment is accessible in your institution? Are people psychologically comfortable being a part of your institution? Are people able to get books even if they can't pay for them? Are people able to get education even if they can't pay for them? Are people able to be included in your college picnics even if they can't pay for them? These are the benchmarks of accessibility, not just technology, not just not, not just personal disability. 
So I hope a time comes when grants are linked to accessibility. I would strongly advocate for that because unfortunately things have not happened the way they should have happened, but never too late. And then of course, curricular design, examination, infrastructure, websites, your materials, your libraries. <coughs> By spending less than 50,000 rupees, 20,000 for the scanner, and another 25, 30 for the computer, you can make your library fully accessible. But chances are not accessible. We can buy lakhs of rupees of books. We will not spend 50,000. We can buy nice tables of 50,000, but not spend on them. That's the attitude is important. Empathy is important. Humanity is important. If we have these, we will need no laws. But if we do need laws, they are there. And they are there in abundance now. There's no shortcoming. We are talking about the RPD Act of 2016, but as early as 2006, there was this national policy on disability, which talks about technology, which talks about accessibility. And now, even a mainstream policy, new education policy, also talks about accessibility higher. The standards are, read, please look at chapter nine. The standards are very strict. And we need to follow, because now if we don't follow, there's going to be a problem. To conclude, I, I would have lots to say, but as the time doesn't permit, I'd have to be, I have, I have had to be very concise. You may say one and a half hour if you're saying concise, but yes, there's not to say on this topic, but I would say that we, we take pride in being Indians. We take pride in being the citizens of a fast developing economy. We take pride in bidding our stake for a permanent seat in the Security Council. Trust me, if we are not an accessible nation, if we are not an inclusive nation, if we are not a sensitive nation, if we leave a part of our family behind, our population behind, and hope to move forward in development that could never happen. If we leave a part of our population behind, in development and accessibility and hope to be a proud citizen of a country which is, which has been the world guru, that claim may be contested. If we leave a part of our family behind and do not make, ensure inclusion and accessibility and yet hope to get a permanent seat in the United Nations, that will be very difficult and may never happen. Therefore, not for just our own growth as an individual. Because what I create for others, I may use it tomorrow myself. I will most probably use tomorrow myself. For our own growth, for the growth of our institution, for the growth of our community, the growth of our country, it's important to embrace these principles of inclusion and accessibility. Access inclusion can only be achieved when your system your materials, your environment, if there is no accessibility, there cannot be any inclusion. And therefore, do not force knots to take their shape, their, exhibit their force, because that would not be good. It's better the laws are there, just use them as guiding principles and exhibit and, and implement before being asked to do so by some agency where we'll not be make, able to make any excuses then of resources or otherwise, because those excuses don't exist anyway, not too much. So I think, uh, I hope this FTP and uh, the, the kind of discussions we have been having would open a new chapter. What has not happened, bygones be bygones, but even an attempt now can change many lives in a very short time, in a month, in six months, in a year, and the world can become much happier by the time we pass 2021 with this hope I thank the organizers once again, congratulate them for organizing this very unique program. Thank the participants for patiently listening. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to now take. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, very, very comprehensive talk. Um, it had elements of, uh, you know, which which really inspired us to to take the right steps that need to be taken. 
uh, also uh, we felt that it was a very very fresh perspective in today's talk that we got like so far we have been discussing about accessibility from the point of view of technology alone but today you uh, made us aware of the legal aspect associated with it you talked about accessibility in terms of syllabus in terms of infrastructure in terms of uh, you know the, uh, the the need for sensitivity so uh, it was a very very uh, amazing talk uh, uh, thank you ever so much for thank sharing you. those ideas yeah and of course our uh, chat box is full of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, many appreciative comments and a lot of questions also so uh, you know i would not like to take uh, their time and i'll very quickly go on to the very first question sir um, it is by sonam zango and he asks that uh, uh, how do equality and reservation go hand in hand when laws are different for both of them sure uh, i'll take two or three together we'll put it there, uh, so okay. i can respond to that yes. most definitely sir uh, the next question is uh, okay just one second yeah the next question is are there uh, academic counselors who are experienced in meeting the needs of the disabled students uh is there and the third question is is there a campus wide sign language interpreter program or real time captioning what is the availability of these services yeah okay so i take this three four time thing <coughs> <coughs> sorry <coughs> excuse me actually uh, i also had a good uh, an hour and a half lecture in the morning and then i remember have meeting in the afternoon so my throat is really you know oh. have been trying to test it today you know <laughs> yeah so just give me a second yeah so so i'm just equality and reservation there is no contradiction and the laws are not different no i uh, i tell you why the laws are not different uh, i would like to refer number 1 to article 16 of the indian constitution which does permit making provisions 15 and 16 which permit making provisions special provisions in in terms of positive discrimination in the form of positive discrimination in favor of those categories who have been left behind uh in fact the reservation for persons with disabilities is under article 16 and the reservation for other categories 164 and for ewc i think 15 5 so there are such provisions inbuilt in our constitution of what we call positive discrimination the term positive discrimination is different from inequality it is to bring a person to equality for instance let me give you a very mundane but a very significant example if you have 100 rupees in your pocket and your brother has 50 rupees and you both have to go to see a movie where the ticket would cost 100 rupees so your father gives you 50 gives you gives your brother 50 rupees more so both of you can go and see the movie and enjoy it together is that a different no is that partiality all he has done is to bring your brother equal to the economic power that you have so you both can enjoy the benefit of the movie together you can both share as brothers because if there inequality existed that you would not be shared remember that communities that we are talking about communities which have certain provisions for reservation are ones who have been oppressed and discriminated against and victimized for centuries centuries and perhaps thousands of years there's been histories of such victimization in fact it 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 cannot the is not possible even reservation they cannot come up to that same level of participation so equality and equity are equality has to be read with a term called equity and often the two terms are interchanged but they are not interchangeable uh equity is, is to do with fairness and justice equality is to do with quantity when you talk about equality you talk about quantity he has one i have one no that one of his is not equal to one of yours because your one is more powerful <coughs> so in terms of quantity it may be equal 
but in terms of equity and fairness and justice, it is not equal. So equality has to be in terms of quantity as well as in terms of fairness, in terms of equity. Now, therefore, reserve. But reservation, why it is it often said that there is no barrier to reservation? Uh, 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 it is possible. I mean, is, I mean, even people who come, who belong to categories where reservation provisions are applicable, are as qualified as meritorious. Be assured of that. The only, the only support they get is that uh, they get space to make up for any deficiency which they may have suffered in their growth or education because of social, cultural, economic conditions. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, it's, uh, whatever deficiencies have been there in the upbringing due to social, economic, cultural reasons, due to which the person may not have been able to perform as well, perhaps, but would have the potential and has a, a capability that that is mitigated to too very very little extent, hardly any five percent or so. How does it matter so much? Little, but then it's not that there is a compromise on quality. No, that is not there. I mean, the laws are not different. It's just there's some relaxation so that if there's any deficiency, that is overcome. So try to see it in that light. As far as uh, uh, the second question about real time description of campus wide. Uh, sign language interpretation was there. Then the, we have some sign language interpretation in our data. I won't say panel data. If a college request, we do provide uh, the charges have to be borne by the college, but then we should be inbuilt in the budgeting. For instance, if the college needs a sign language interpreter, can the UGC, this is the accessibility law, this is my requirement, I want money. No, UGC will not be able to decline that, should not. If they do, we'll see that what we can do, definitely. Then NGOs are there to take care of that issue. That's, that, that, that's not a problem. Uh, so real-time capturing, uh, some apps are being experimented, which in, instantly convert text into uh, speech into text. Google also has the Google Translator and all that. Uh, but synthesizing these with the programs and with the lectures is not that easy. I would also say the accuracy may suffer sometimes, but doesn't matter. Something is better than other. Another thing, but yes, work is happening. And just as for the visually impaired, uh, that has happened last two, three years. A lot of apps have come out. I'll give you a small example. Uh, my wife passed away just two or three months, three months ago. And uh, one challenge I faced was that if a document came home and letter or circular, if I have to sign something immediately because I mean, administration files are sent home, how would I read? Because I may not have assistance all the time. When I mean, she was there, she would help read or she would to see the document. How would I read? So I immediately got an app which reads in real time and reads reasonably well. So when a document is ordered to show you the camera, it starts reading immediately. It may not be, it's fairly accurate you know, to begin with. But even if there's a 5% problem, that doesn't matter. It gives me the document orientation. I know what's all about and whether I should sign or not sign it. So that so I'm very independent now in checking, picking up any paper at home and seeing as to what is there as to what is there. So that problem is immediate, immediately solved, that immediately solved. What are the second question, uh, uh, Nupar, before we have uh, the two hands, Swati is, Swati is there, I think Shadu is also there. Yeah. Uh, you, sir. Yeah, so sir, uh, the second, second question, question was? Yeah, the second question was that, are there academic counselors who are experienced in meeting <coughs> the needs of disabled students? Uh, yes, uh, every college should have. <laughs> UGC does mandate every college should have an equal opportunity set and faculty members who are sensitive, who understand the needs of students should be there. This is the people, it is counseling is not a professional activity. It is a human activity. I see it that way. As far as higher education is concerned, nobody can understand you better than person who has gone through the same experience and who is your teacher now. Thankfully, almost every college now has persons with disabilities. If you talk about disability for faculty members or non-teaching staff, there are teacher, other teachers who are involved with disabilities who may not be disabled themselves, but they are involved with disability. And there are people who are sensitive to marginalized marginality because marginality studies is a very important area these days. And many people in faculty are working in many colleges. 
So talk to any of them, but I think the EOC or the enabling units should be the place for having such volunteers, faculty volunteers who, who should meet students when they require, for whom students can approach. And I think that structure should be put in place. Maybe we've been also right, it's a good suggestion. We've been also right from university to all college to create such infrastructure. Thank you. Just give me a second. Yes, sir. Yes, Thank Nupa, you. next. Yes, sir. Thank you so much uh, uh, for those responses to the question, sir. In fact, there are a, lo a lot of questions uh, which uh, talk about access, which talk about technology and universities' readiness to uh, uh, take uh, them up. But I think that you have already answered those questions uh, uh, in this uh, recent explanation, sir. But uh, one question is by uh, Vikas Kapoor from Ramjus College. And he asked that uh, it's a it's a longish question come comment, but I'll kind of try to uh, shorten it a bit. So he is talking about the fact that how there are plenty of laws um, uh, available, uh, uh, you know, with respect to um, uh, disability. But he asked that uh, how do we make sure that they are enforced at every level? Uh, he seems to be talking about, uh, he, he, he gives a reference of IRCTC, he gives a reference of uh, DMRC, <coughs> how both these institutions are not exactly disabled friendly and how people face a lot of issues. So then this, this, this gap between laws and their enforcements is his concern, sir. Yes, because uh, definitely uh, this concern is very valid. No doubt there is a gap. No doubt there is a huge gap. I would say huge gap between laws. Laws are all in place. We have the policies, we have the documents, so no problem. Uh, the biggest defaulter is the government of India, which has made the laws. That is also an irony. Uh, <clears throat> may I just share with you uh, that when PWD Act was made, uh, I was in a committee at that time, in the ICB Education Committee, and we thought, uh, 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 we thought we should now use the 3% uh, reservation uh, clause in employment to ensure that there is one percent reservation for visually impaired in the higher education institution. So we wrote to the UGC, and you won't believe we have a letter from a very high, one of the highest officials of UGC, written to us in 1997 October, saying that the PWDI did not apply on UGC. That is a body sitting two kilometers from Parliament of India, which passed that act. It did not apply, it applies only in government department. We had to go to Supreme Court. The case is on record. Uh, along with Sunanda Trust, we did a case, case 115 and 116 of 1998, under which we asked for 5% indexation in net examination, 1% reservation, and benefits equal to SCST uh, uh, in, in UPSC, an extra time. And you can see there's a Supreme Court order of 19th of March 2002 by which these facilities were provided. So the, I suppose if laws are not implemented, law courts are the only solution. But before that, a lot of dialogue should take place. A lot of discussion should take place uh, with those who are to implement the laws and even within the sector so that uh, the sector itself is not seen to be at cross purposes. And that can happen only when dialogue takes place. We need to discuss among ourselves and try to take a unified position. And also then talk to those who have to implement, understand their concern, not just ask their concern, understand. Because the one big challenge is money. Definitely is a big challenge because UGC, while it doesn't even grant us a different issue, many people do not know perhaps. For EOC, under the name EOC, budget head, for the 12th plan, the total grant from UGC to EOC Delhi University under the name UGC was two lakh rupees for five years. For five years, and there was some grant later came for coaching for SCST OBC, which has gone to the adult and contextual department, which we don't have with us. So two lakh rupees for five years, 40,000 for each year. What happens in that? Can we really do anything? But then the university to whatever extent possible was able to get money from other sources and has done whatever it could. Uh, one thing I must say, Vikas, your friends, and that's an honest statement, there will never be perfection in disability empowerment because, our, because challenges are too many. Resources would never be enough, but whatever we have, we should put the proper use <laughs> and try to generate more resources. Even in USA, not all books are accessible for visually impaired. It is time when they don't language issue. Most of their books are in English, which is very easy to make accessible. 
there's no problem no no challenge in making english materials accessible as you know and i know and many others know i see aruni here and many others um uh, so but the point is that but we should try for always something better but we should also try to understand that there are if there are genuine concern or there's a tardiness if there is insensitivity and tardiness we should fight it out if there genuine concerns we should understand and then work together to ensure that those concerns are you know solved those issues are solved that, that that would be a way i suppose yes thank you so much for summarizing that so well for us sir and uh, giving us uh, just the right vision that we need to go ahead from here thank you so much for those wonderful uh, words of yours sir Uh, there was some hand raised. Swasti was hand raised. Shanu was there. If they want to ask a question, if there is any. Yes, sir. We all are there. <laughs> you are there. Achha. No, no, no. No, they are there. The, the hand raised were there. They were hand there raised for them. So I saw the hand uh, raised. Smriti, ma'am, do we uh, do we allow the participants to unmute themselves? No, no. Achha, achha. No, wait, no. Wait, okay, wait, okay. Wait. Okay, it's not. Wait. It's not allowed. Okay, sorry, I didn't know that. Okay, it's not allowed. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so now I would like to call upon our convener, uh, Dr. Smriti Singh, to uh, to officially uh, thank um, uh, Dr. Anija. Over to you, ma'am. Um, uh, it is very difficult to formally thank Professor Anija because enabling unit Maitrey College program never completes without Professor Anija's lecture, and we are privileged enough to have you today, sir. the way you have discussed about accessibility yes sir we did try for sign language but we found out we don't required it because we didn't did not have any hi candidate with us that's why we did not get but yeah that is not an excuse we should have got <coughs> and uh, because there uh, this lectures will go on youtube and then there can be other people can be accessing it and it would be not accessible for everyone and uh, but yeah we are organizing we are somewhere making picture basic like one day you cannot make aware about sign language everyone but on 30th we have program on sign language we will try to teach some part of sign language to all the teachers which we can use in the class and next time we will try our level best to make everything accessible in that way but um yeah it is a mistake from our side i humbly accept it and uh, like i'm uh, i really seek for your forgiveness and um, it is my privilege to thank you sir the way you delivered lecture the way the uh, the way we were aware of course we had talk about accessible syllabus on 24th and we talked about curriculum and accessibility and everything and that was also beneficial but the law which comes on the way and you made us aware we are privileged enough sir thank you so much and It's we really pleasure. appreciate it yeah thanks for giving me the opportunity such uh, interactions are learning experience for me also so thank you for very much for giving me the opportunity to be with all of you thank you very much we request a, uh, mm -hmm. just a minute sir yeah. you have to hang on we request yeah. all the participants to um, switch on their camera and so we can have a good photograph with sir please uh, technical coordinators give access to camera uh, yes ma'am everybody has the access now now please switch on your camera please switch on your videos thank you so much everybody thank you thank you lot. very much thank you so much sir now i request our technical coordinator to switch off the recorder so we can switch on recorder for the next session